So it's going to be a short lecture, short on content. Um, we'll review yesterday's lecture. We'll mention mixing chambers. Um, so we'll finish off talking about mixing chambers. Uh, talk about heat exchangers, and that'll be our thermodynamic components part of things. Um, and then I'll devote maybe the last half of the lecture to talk about heat transfer. So we'll, that's our intention for today. Um, this is my announcement. So this is my little family. Um, yeah, I know. He's really cute. So it's not obvious from the, what you can see there, or it might not be obvious from what you can see there, and you've only got that one picture to go on, but one of my family members is about to have a really big life event happen in the next few days. It's my young son. He's not turning two. It's actually, it's that one. Thank you. So, and, and Vanessa's kind of having some stuff go on too. So, uh, sometime in the next three weeks, um, my youngest son will be born. That's actually my oldest son, because um, that's how you measure things. Um, in terms of work-wise, I'm getting a fortnight off nominally. Um, I will emphasize being here for lectures. I lecture three days of the week, so I'm going to take the other two days off. Um, but if my wife's in labor, I'll be there. So <laughs> this person's not related to me, but if you see him stand up and try and teach you thermodynamics, um, that's John Olson, right? Uh, John Olson ran this course before me, so I started in 2017. Uh, this is my second operation of the course. He did it the 20 years before that. So he's got this stuff down pat. It's excellent. Um, hopefully it'll just strategically align. He can teach some, some tough content. Um, that photo is about 15 years old. So if an older version of that turns up, tries to do thermodynamics. Um, no, so John, uh, look, John really knows his stuff. Um, he's a great teacher. When you, when you uh, talk to students about him and you read what students write about him in, in reviews and so forth, um, he is r really good at presenting content. He has some pretty, uh, what I would call old school understanding of how a classroom should operate. So just be prepared to take notes by hand, for example. He doesn't like people taking photos of things. He'll probably use whiteboards, not the, not the note. <coughs> Um, the video camera will capture what happens in the room, so it'll be available on recording afterwards. Um, but, you know, in light of the fact he's taking a lecture for me, I don't want to try and control what he does too much. But he is a good teacher. He, does, he definitely knows his stuff, um, if you're willing to learn from him. Um, so yesterday, that was it, quick announcement. Um, yesterday, we introduced the idea that the first law also applies to open steady state steady flow systems. And then we did three or four kind of classes of components. We talked about shaft work machines, compressors, turbines, and pumps. Uh, we talked about throttles, nozzles, and diffusers, so converting pressure energy to velocity energy and vice versa. Um, and then also mixing chambers. Uh, and I finished on, oh, uh, I fixed, I finished on talking about flash vessels. So I wanted to show you a flash vessel and how those can be arranged, um, which I called an anti-mixing chamber. Uh, I did want to just mention, so we talked about uh, compressors. It's also true of pumps and turbines. This is just a, um, something I had in a manual. I was actually flipping through looking for something else, and I found this. So this is a manufacturer's advice on selecting their fans. So once you've decided to, to go with a Abara Hamada blower, then you say, well, how much gas flow do we want? So this is a logarithmic scale in meters cubed per minute. Interesting that it's in meters cubed per minute. Um, you often see that with an S in front of it. Because we know if you compress a gas, um, it responds differently, right? So we would talk about kilograms per second is what we care about. Um, often you see this written as normal meters cubed per minute or per second normal means at standard pressure. And of course, the compressor compresses it, so out the back end you don't get as much in terms of meters cubed per, per minute, but you get the same kilograms per second. Um, so that's gas flow, and this is then pressure. Again, on log scale, KPA, so very low pressure. So this is 100 pascals of pressure, and this is 100 KPA. Um, 
with compressors, you can go up to uh, one megapascal quite reasonably. Um, but this is just saying, so within this range, and they say, choose a product from our line fan range. You can see the ones down here talk about like axial or inline, low pressure, right? Whatever the, um, whatever the CFM you need, um, sorry, the gas flow you need. The ones up here start to use the word blower. And they probably more involve a positive displacement kind of arrangement. Um, here you've got things that use multiple fans. So they're probably f axial fans one after the other to try and maintain the pressure drop. Um, this is also true of pumps and I guess turbines, although I've not, never spec'd out turbines, um, but certainly pumps spec in this way. So just to make you aware, um, yeah, I guess my example with the, with the ball firing mechanism was have some understanding of what you're expecting the device to do and what kind of device performs in that way. Mixing chambers, I finished on this. So the idea that you can have a feed and then, so you've got one line coming in that's maybe giving you a mixture of vapor and liquid and then you're tapping the liquid off and you're tapping the vapor off and you're exploiting the difference in those two things. This is a process and flow diagram of the refinery that I used to work at. Um, it's probably proprietary, so let's zoom in. Um, there are we, blah, blah, blah. Cool, this one, radio. Thank you for asking where I worked, what, what the process was. So we used to take uh, brown dirt, it's called bauxite, and it contains lots of stuff. It's got some iron ore in it, so that's what makes it look brown, but it also contains aluminium hydrate, aluminium oxide hydrate. Um, and the way that you, so aluminium used to be as expensive as gold. Like if you were setting out cutlery for people, right? Yeah, everyone's done silver and gold. If you can get enough aluminium to make your cutlery out of, you are evidencing that you are rich. This process was invented and aluminium is now used for structural materials, right? Like al this process made aluminium cheap. And what they did was they used NaOH, which is um, sodium hydroxide, and which is a caustic, right? If it, it burns you like acid, but it's on the other end of the pH scale. Um, when you dissolve bauxite in caustic soda, the aluminium hydrate goes into solution with, so it becomes part of the liquid, and then you can filter off all the solid product, and then you've got a liquid that carries a lot of um, aluminum hydrate in it. Then, if you do that at a high temperature, and then you lower the temperature, Right. Has anyone grown sugar crystals before? We, we could do it. We do it in class. You heat water up and then you add sugar and all the sugars dissolve. Then you cool the water down and the water is super saturated with sugar. And then you put a fork in, which creates a sharp point for nucleation. And then sugar crystals grow off the end of the fork. Right? If you haven't done it or seen it, you could probably YouTube it. Someone can do it on your behalf. No need to... Right, same thing, okay? So you heat this up, you digest it, okay? So digesting is the process of breaking down. So this is a digester, so it's taking place at 175 degrees C and 750 kPa, so it's a liquid. So even though it's above 100 degrees C, it's not a gas, it's not a vapor, the pressure maintains it to be a liquid. And this is where the, the hydrate is going into the caustic solution and it's going to supersaturate. but to do that we need to reduce the temperature and pressure, okay? So let's talk about how it gets there. This is our feed. So the green line is our feed line. So that's bringing our cold, undigested solution in. It's coming through and these double tubes are slurry heaters. So this is our slurry line is in green. This is heating it up and it's heating up successively from kind of 60 degrees C, maybe 65, um, going through one, two, three, four, and a fifth slurry heater to get it up to 175, okay? So that's doing that. But heat is expensive and water takes, it's essentially water, it's got lots of obviously contaminants in it. Water takes a lot of energy to heat up. So what do you do? And out of the digester, right, you can see up and over and down, it comes into 
these things which are called flash vessels. I can't draw in this because it's a PDF, which is a pity. But, so the, this goes in, and this flash vessel is not at 750 kPa, this is like at 650 kPa, right? And so at 650 kPa, at 175 degrees, some of the product leaves as vapour. And it leaves as vapour and goes up into the slurry heater and then that reheats the incoming product. Right? But then some of, the pro some of it doesn't flash off as steam and as the stuff flashes off as steam, it reduces the temperature of the remaining product. You tap that remaining product off, take it over to the next flash vessel and that flash vessel is at 500 kPa. So more steam flashes off, you take that up into a, another slurry heater and you take the 500 kPa off into the next flash vessel. So there's five flash vessels in a row and they successively reduce the temperature down to atmospheric pressure and indeed this pump, the DBO pump, um, which is like digester, blow down or something. I forget all the lines. Um, so you can actually run that pump and have this last one at a slight vacuum, all right? So you can get the temperature below 100 degrees and each time you use the flash off in the slurry heaters back the other way to warm the product going in. So you need much less energy. Where does the remaining energy come from? Because obviously you don't totally recover all of your energy. And the answer is this 1300 kPa steam line, uh, which I mentioned in a previous lecture as well. So this is coming from the ring main that, that fell off its supports. Um, so it's going to the final one and that's giving the final injection of heat to get it up to that 175. Um, cool. More complicated than anything that we would look at uh, in a single uh, setting, but just to show you that we can use this kind of thing, we can use the density. Uh, that also um, does something chemical because it's not a pure substance. The water boils off and flashes off as steam. You can condense that down and you've got basically water whereas the heavier product, that which doesn't boil, um, contains more bauxite. Um, and so you're, you're exploiting something chemical as well as thermal. In this subject, we only deal with pure substances, so we assume we're only doing thermal effects. Anyway, I thought it would be interesting to see um, an example of that. So that's mixing chambers. So the idea with the mixing chamber was we had maybe multiple inputs, maybe multiple outputs, and the mass times the enthalpy of each of our inputs must equal the mass times the enthalpy of each of our outputs because it's a steady state, steady flow system. Um, we'll see it in the ranking, in the improved ranking cycle. And our last thermodynamic component is heat exchangers. Um, this is looking from on, on top of a calcine. I don't know if you can get a sense for how far away the ground is here. I showed you a, a picture of an impeller on a truck and said it was about an 11 or 13 tonne impeller. That impeller is sitting here, so that's a fan. It's drawing air around the corner down here. So that's a fan, this is a two megawatt motor. So that's a 6.6 kV motor. So it's taking high voltage in, which is rare. But the focus of this photo is these three fans here. Um, and they are drawing air from underneath them and pushing it up into the atmosphere. So they're drawing air and then there's an inlet manifold here for water and the water's going through this way. Then there's an outlet header there and that's going back to a pump, which interestingly I showed you a photo of in this section as well. And this is reducing the temperature of the water. So I've got hot water that we want to be cool. And so we're pumping the water past fans. The fans are moving air past the tubes um, and they're cooling down the water. So this is a heat exchanger. Um, call it, this is called a fin fan cooler. This is from the ground. So the air is being drawn from the bottom to the top and the water is going, this green thing here is the outlet header and that's the outlet pipe and so forth.
We've always got time for a story. These bracings, oh, whatever. These bracings are aftermarket. It's not obvious because they, they painted them the same color. When they originally designed this structure, they only had the vertical support columns in there and someone using MN 1300, MN 2400 style mathematics and mechanics said, she'll be right, it'll sit straight down, right? I know, isn't that dreadful? <laughs> um, but when the fans turned, they created a vibration. And this whole structure, we had, we had danger flags around it and said no one can walk under it because it might fall down. Um, yeah, the whole, the whole structure, like it's from a static loading perspective, it all worked, but in a dynamic case, uh, the whole thing was tearing itself apart. So we put in these, I didn't do this, this was a structural engineer who did this. They put in those cross members and it's always, sorry. Um, I have a low opinion of some of the engineers involved <laughs> in the upgrade. Because my, my job was to maintain this kit. We spent a billion dollars installing it and then I came along and it was underperforming and I didn't, some of it was stuff I didn't address um, and some of it was stuff I had to. So, fin fan cooler, this is from the spec sheet. Uh, so this is a manufacturer. Uh, again, it's, it's possibly proprietary. Don't worry about that. So, just to show you like when we're talking about heat exchangers, so what do we got? 200,000 kilograms an hour of fluid flow. Um, that's an, an Olympic sized swimming pool every 12 hours flowing through this device. The temperature comes in at 67 and leaves at 45 according to the spec. Drawing through a bit over a million kilograms per hour of air. Air is not very dense, that's a lot of air. The volumetrically, that's a lot of air. Um, and the air is warming up from 35 to 45. So this is in WA, so they've spec'd it out for a reasonably hot day. Um, so that's the spec. When you put those numbers into, okay, well the energy from the water must be going into the air. So the energy the water loses must be energy the air gains. So I did that math, hoping to demonstrate thermodynamics in action. Um, according to those numbers, the water loses five megawatt of heat and the air gains three and a half megawatt. I've got, I don't know how that, I don't know how they think that's working, um, but that's okay. Uh, the device ended up working. We only ran one of the fans most of the time because uh, we didn't want to underchill the water for other reasons. But that's the kind of math that you would do, right? That the, there's some change of energy in the, in the water and there's some change of energy in the air Actually, I, sorry, I ended up using CP to try and get... Um, and those numbers should be equivalent or the air should get slightly hotter because you should have to cool the motors down as well. The motors should warm the air up as they go. Um, so what's a heat exchanger? That's, that's just, you know... So heat exchanger allows a transfer of heat without contaminating the flow streams. So the water doesn't leak into the air, the air doesn't leak into the water, so there's a... Uh, watertight seal between the two streams, um, but you get temperature transmission between them. Yeah, go. Um, with a heat exchanger, yeah. is it instructed to have a larger volume of air or a larger pressure so that it decreases the temperature? Is there a, it's kilograms per second, yep. Okay. yep. So you want larger mass of air through the system because that's your heat capacity. Yep. If you pressurize the air, it will uh, Vol you know, then for the same volume you'll get more mass. Yep. That was open to atmosphere, so it's just atmospheric pressure. Um, it's a good question. Good. Uh, it, it may sound obvious, although the first law of thermodynamics doesn't define that this is true, that you can't make the hot fluid colder than your cold fluid comes in at. <laughs> right? So that, that should, you know, don't get stuck on that. Just, <laughs> um, it's not it's not required by the first law of thermodynamics, which is why we need to do the second law of thermodynamics, which will start next week. Uh, you can do count counterflow or parallel flow heat exchangers. So parallel flow is you bring your hot fluid in and your cold fluid in, and they kind of tend towards the same temperature, right, over some length of engagement, okay? So this would be parallel flow. Counterflow would be 
over some length of engagement, you have your hot fluid come in here and it's going that way, and you have your hot cold fluid come in at that end and it's going that way. And we will discuss over some length of engagement, sorry the vertical axis here is temperature. We will discuss in MEC 3610 which of those is most efficient and why. But it can be um, counter flow or parallel flow. This is a plate type heat exchanger. So I was a contract manager for plate heat exchangers at the refinery. Um, that's not very, so the idea here is you have an inlet for fluid one, for, for fluid A there, and an outlet for fluid A there. And you might have an inlet for fluid B here, and an outlet for fluid B there, okay? And each fluid comes in here and then works its way, this fluid's going like that, through a tortuous path, tortuous meaning windy path, and then the other fluid, which is there, is not between those two plates, but is between the next two plates, okay? So you can see here there's a series of plates, okay? So between the odd-numbered plates, you'll have fluid A, and between the even-numbered plates, you'd have fluid B. And so there's lots of surface area there for them to transmit heat, but it's sealed one from the other, so you don't contaminate the fluids. Uh, a problem you get here is the gaps are sometimes quite small and you get buildup of product in them. Uh, you assemble these plates on long like a coat rack and then you tighten up these bolts. So this is big threaded rods with nuts here. You tighten up these nuts and it pushes all the plates together and forms a seal. So that's a plate type heat exchanger. You can also have shell and tube um, and obviously open like the fin fan cooler is a different type of heat exchanger as well. So here's a question type of question we want to be able to solve. So air is cooled by water. So you're trying to cool air down by water um, in an intercooler between two compressors. Your lab T2 has an intercooler between two compressors. Uh, air enters the intercooler at a mass flow rate. So we get a mass flow rate of air, a temperature that the air comes in at. Uh, we want to cool that down by 125 degrees, looks like. What mass flow rate of water is required if we limit the increase in temperature of the water to 15 degrees? So we don't want the water to get hotter than something. Um, assume constant heat capacities, uh, which seems reasonable. We've only got a 100 degree change in air. Um, so we can answer that. So how do we answer that? We've got a governing first law equation, which we've seen before, right? How does this play out in a heat exchanger? Well, our mass in equals our mass out, except that we've kind of got this twice this time around, because you've got two fluid flows. You've got a fluid flow A, where mass in must equal mass out, and you've got a fluid flow B, where mass in must equal mass out. You can't put in extra A and get out extra B, because the flows are isolated, right? So we might have a Q term. It might be evolving heat to the environment or absorbing heat from the environment. We might have a shaft work term, although often not, um, within a heat exchanger. You can see here that we've limited ourselves to two fluid flows in and out. And I've kind of drawn a very simple shell and tube heat exchanger. Actually, I didn't draw it. Sorry, I stole off the internet, um, but referenced it appropriately. Kind of got a, a very simple shell and tube heat exchanger here. So we've got one fluid coming in here and leaving there. And you've got another fluid coming in here and leaving there. So it's a counterflow heat exchanger. And we've called them fluids A and fluid B. So we've got some mass flow rate B and some mass flow rate A. And when you cancel everything out, you see that for mass flow rate A, the diff times the difference in enthalpies. So the, the, this then becomes the overall energy that mass flow rate A loses, for example, must be the same as the mass flow rate that B, fluid B, gains, or vice versa. They haven't definitely specified which one is getting hotter, which one's getting colder. With some Q and W terms to augment that as well. 
If it's adiabatic and there's no, um, there's no shaft work there, that simplifies out to be much more, right? You can see the enthalpy one's losing as the enthalpy of the other's gaining. And this is what I tried to do with my water and air for the fin fan cooler. Um, the maths didn't hold up and that's fine. So let's do a calculated example of that just to see what it looks like. Are there any questions about heat exchangers? Um, mixing chambers? Ah, oh, no. Hang about. Caps lock on. Oh, yeah. There's a nozzle and diffuser calculation as well that I haven't done. I'll just throw it up. That's okay. Go away. Cool. Not you guys, that guy. Um, all right, excellent. So what sort of things do we need to know to solve this problem? The air is changing temperature by 125 degrees, and the water is changing temperature by 10 degrees. Any sense on what the flow might be? So one kilogram a second, 10 kilograms a second, 100 kilograms a second? This is the same question as the copper ball in the water, except this is a flow, but pretty much it's exactly the same math. <sighs> right, good. Let's do it. So what do we need to know? We've said it's adiabatic and there's no mention of shaft work. So we can use the m dot h2 minus h1. Let's just call it delta h. Right, that kind of seems reasonable. We're given a mass flow rate of, let's call fluid A air. So given a mass flow rate of 10. Delta H for an ideal gas is uh, M dot CP delta T. We want our mass flow rate for H2O. And the delta H for water will be um, C delta T. So that'll be 10 times 1.005 times 175 oops, minus 50 equals m dot h2o. What's the specific capacity, heat capacity of water? Oh, I'll accept 4.18. I, I, for some reason, I think it's 4.192, but that's okay. I'll go with 4.19. And we've defined a temperature difference of 15. It feels like we can just rearrange that equation and plug it in our calculator. And I get, no. Who gets it first? Any questions about what I've done? Yeah. Why don't I use enthalpy and ignore pressure for both the air and the water? It's a great question. Um, heat, in, a, in an idealized case, a heat exchanger will have no pressure drop across the, across the inlet and the outlet. Um, having pressure drop across the inlet and the outlet requires you to know the geometry of the unit and some stuff about fluid pressure loss in a pipe, which we don't know at the moment. Um, but you could have a defined pressure drop. So you could say the air loses 10 kilopascals of pressure and then you'd have to take it into account. But because it's a constant pressure process and because we're dealing with enthalpy H, um, I've used CP. So using CP for the air acknowledges that it's enthalpy. Uh, if it was U, if it was in, uh, specific internal energy, I'd have to use CV. So I have acknowledged the, the pressure component of that by using CP. 
uh, for water pressure, unless you've got massive pressure changes, which you don't, which you just won't, um, you won't, no, you'll not, you won't take pressure into account for the water. And the answer was? Twenty, excellent. Kilo grams per second. Thank you. That'll do. Radio. So, in this case, the air is changing. The delta T on the air is much greater than the delta T on the water, but water has a much higher heat capacity, so it feels about right. Um, we need about twice the amount of water in kilograms per second. Now we do air. Volumetrically, we would need a much lower volume of uh, water to make that all work. So that's a heat exchanger style question. Um, question three in quiz one last year was a heat exchanger question. Um, cool. Quickly, and it's not in the curriculum, I wanted to talk about heat transfer. <laughs> so if you only care about marks, this bit isn't for you. No, oh, that's sad. That's fine. I can handle it. Um, heat transfer is something we do. In MEC 3610, heat transfer is about half the curriculum. Okay? So understanding why heat, why heat is transmitted at the rate at which it's transmitted is a really complicated subject um, and takes quite a bit of time to do well. But I just want to acknowledge, like in thermodynamics, we say this much heat flows or this heat rate. Or for example, I just showed you a plate heat exchanger and said there's lots of surface area there and that helps the heat be transmitted, right? There's so many design com aspects that require a knowledge of heat transfer that I just wanted to mention it. I also pulled in one topic from advanced thermo into thermo um, that doesn't make sense without an understanding of heat transfer. So I just want you to know that this heat isn't happening instantaneously and it's requiring a few things in order to happen. You arrive at a great time. So, here's something, I think this is interesting, and sorry about the terrible graphics. If you've got a bonfire at some distance and you're standing singing Kumbaya with your friends, what aspect of the fire makes you feel warm, right? And this is interesting to me because you're not in contact with it. The hot air from the fire is rising and potentially not going anywhere near you. So how do you get warm? As mechanical engineers, we should have an opinion on that. There's three ways of heat, that heat is transferred. The first one is conduction. Okay, so this is through solids. Typically, we think of conduction as what occurs through solids. And because the molecules are linked through chemical bonds, they have heat transfer through them. What do you think is involved in transmitting the heat? So what, what factors would determine how much heat is transferred through a particular solid? What things should be involved? The thickness of the material will be a factor that's involved. Heat transfer what? Heat capacity, it's not heat capacity. Conductivity. Conductivity is the word. So it's not how much it contains, but it's how quickly it goes through. There's another two factors that are, that are involved. Density. No, density is about the, uh, the property of the material. Once you've got heat capacity, you don't need to know anything about the material. The surface area over which it's transmitted is an important factor. And then the other one is the temperature difference between the two sides. Right, so for a larger temperature difference, more heat is transmitted. If there's no temperature difference, you won't get any heat transmitted. Fourier's law of uh, thermal conductivity says the heat transmitted through a body is, so this K term captures everything about the material, so it's thermal conductivity. The A term is the area of the surface, so if you double the surface, you get twice the heat transfer. Delta T is the difference in temperatures between the hot side and the cold side. And delta X is the thickness of the material. So if you have more thickness of material, it reduces the amount of heat that can be transferred. Here's some thermal, thermal conductivity values. Metals typically have high values. So aluminium is a metal, tungsten is a metal, 
chromium is a metal. Ceramics typically have low values. Um, sand is a ceramic. Uh, this is asbestos, just for just for out of interest. Um, the notable ceramic that is um, an outlier to that is diamond. Diamond has very good thermal conductivity. Um, I don't know how you can use that information because it's expensive, but um, I've never used it. On the right-hand side, if you can keep a gas or a fluid from moving, they have very low thermal conductivities, all right? Um, and that's relevant when we talk about things like a thermos or double glazed windows. So if you can trap air so it doesn't move, it has a very low thermal conductivity, uh, which is something we can exploit. Chalk is a solid. I don't know why it's on that side. I apologize. Yeah. Conduction, convection. So if there were three ways of transmitting heat, one is conduction, it's solids, it's things that are touching. Convection has to do with the interface between a solid and a fluid, so a gas or a liquid. Okay? And as the, as the gas moves across the surface, it takes the heat with it and the heat joins the bulk solid. So our heat there is, again, proportional to the surface area. It's proportional to the difference between the temperature of the surface and T infinity. Here is the temperature of the bulk, the bulk fluid. Okay, so the room is 20 degrees. As you get close to a hot surface, which might be the back of this monitor, right, the temperature changes, but T infinity is out here. And H is something to do with the fluid. It's where we put all of our, uh, our composition, our phase, so liquids transmit, so liquid H2O transmits much better than gaseous H2O, for example. Uh, the velocity, so if you've got a strong breeze across your skin, it will feel colder, right? So the velocity uh, matters with H. Um, the roughness of the surface also has some effects, so the, vortic the vorticity and so forth. But we can categorize all that as H for our purposes. There is some um, coefficient of convection, I think it's called. So that's convection. Radiation is the other way that heat is transferred. And our formula for radiation involves surface area again. Okay? It's the difference between the object's surface and the temperature of the surroundings. So if you go somewhere cold, you lose heat, but the, the surroundings don't give you any heat back. And then it's got Boltzmann's constant which is a very small number. So you need quite reasonable temperatures to get any sort of decent radiation. But if you've ever been close to, um, probably not, but I've been close to liquid uh, pig iron when it's being poured, so 1550 degrees C, right? That's, by the time you are, so what are we? We're 300 K, that's 1800 K. So that's six times. By the time you're six times hotter, and that's off to the power of four, right? the radiation coming off that is absolutely phenomenal. And then the other one is emissivity. So this is a property of the surface of the material. If you paint something black, it absorbs more heat and also evolves more heat. Yeah? If you stuck your hand out of a car window and say the air was like 10 degrees colder than your body, yep. Yes. If you stuck your hand out and it's a little bit warmer than your body, would you feel warmer? If you stick your hand out a car window and the air is colder or warmer than your body, so what do you feel? Warmer than your body. If it's colder, you definitely feel colder. Yep. If it's warmer, there's a few things going on. One is convection. So the air temperature, so say it's like 45, so you're out in Cobar. Um, convection is driving heat towards your hand but you've probably got sweat and evaporation effects. And as the sweat boils off your skin, it's cooling your skin down. So tough to say. Convection is driving heat towards you. Yep. Um, it's a problem with saunas because they're hot and they're humid. There's no way for your body to lose the energy. So saunas can, be, saunas can raise your core body temperature because once you're in an environment that's hotter than your body should be and it's high humidity so you can't sweat or sweating is ineffective, yeah. But yes, convection drives towards 
convection drives from the hotter body to the cooler body. So that's true. Um, so this is interesting, I think, because the air around you would be cold, cold night, bonfire, and what you're feeling is the radiation heat from the fire, even though the air might be cold. Next week, we're going to talk about um, forgotten second law of thermodynamics. Um, and we're going to introduce some idealized cycles which involve heat transfer across no temperature difference. My your takeaway from this section is that heat transfer requires a difference in temperature between two bodies. That was just a quick section on that. Were there any other questions? Because that's the afternoon. Have you, hang on, have you got your clipboard and your pen back, Melissa? Who's got Melissa's clipboard and pen? Good. All right, it's just down here. Excellent. Thanks, guys. I will hopefully see you next week.